Well, um, I want to introduce myself. I want to introduce you to Bidler. Uh, so I'm Rebecca Haynes. I'm the executive director of Audubon, South Carolina. I'm six months in. So I've had yeah. so much fun. Learning about the amazing work of the staff of Audubon South Carolina and the really cool partners that are with us in this space today. In South Carolina, we are the stewards and managers of 30,000 acres of land that includes 18,000 acres here at Bidler and parts of the broader Four Holes Swamp watershed. I love the idea of protecting a watershed. Bidler Forest, this sanctuary, turns 50 years old next year. Um, and these uh, Trees hold so much cool history uh, for birds, but also people. And that's one thing that we haven't done a lot of, right, is, is talking about the cultural history as well as the natural history, the full inclusive history of a space and of a place. Because at Audubon, we care about the birds, of course, but birds need the communities to thrive. We need each other. So um, we are so excited to do this work. Uh, so today we're going to talk about the Underground Railroad designation and commemorate that um, with some of our very cool partners and supporters here. Um, Sherry Jackson is the Southeast Regional Manager for the National Park Service National Underground Railroad Network to Freedom program uh, that we are so happy to be a part of. Um, she has worked for the National Park Service for, I'm going to round up and say almost 30 years, a little over 30 years maybe. Um, and she has been working on the Network to Freedom program for 20 of those. Um, she works with local, state, and federal entities and as well as interested individuals, partners, organizations to help them in this journey. She's been a real asset to us. So with that, I wanted to introduce Sherry. Oh. Well, again, I'm Sherry Jackson with the National Park Service Underground Railroad Network to Freedom program. The program just celebrated 25 years, 25 years of telling the story of the Underground Railroad. And ways we tell this story, we tell this story through sites, through facilities and programs. And so for the last 25 years, we've been collecting stories around the country. And now we've been able to connect people's routes places where they escaped from and places where people may have uh, settled. And so when you think about the National Park Service, you think we are a, a national program, national organization that preserves history. And so this program preserves the history of enslavement and resistance here in the United States. We know that Africans resisted in Africa, they resisted on the uh, ships coming over here they resisted once they arrived and so I like to start off talking about how we define the Underground Railroad. We define it as the resistance to enslavement and so when we're talking about places of the Underground Railroad think about how those Africans resisted and we look at their flight. We look at places where they escaped from and places where they settled. Some people went north and we know that some people went south and some people went to maroon communities. Yes. Not always looking to get away from a particular state or region, but sometimes they were just trying to be close to family. There's a story about a, a man who ran away, but he left his wife and children. And every year, the wife would get pregnant and all the children would look like the father who ran away. <laughs> get where I'm going. He didn't necessarily run, run away, but maybe he was just close by in a maroon community. And so today we are uh, in the midst of celebrating September as the International Underground Railroad Month. You may be asking why September? Well, Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman escaped in September. And so Maryland had decided that, hey, we we're going to look at creating September as International Underground Railroad Month. So, wonderful time to be here, September, here in this place, this site, and this land. And so you may be asking, where is the Underground Railroad? Just look around. <laughs> it was a place, even if it was for a moment, for a day, or a week, 
but it was a place where people saw this land as a site of resistance but also a site of freedom and so we are just um, excited to be a part of this event and once you become a member in the network you can apply for a grant and of course uh, later you'll hear about the grant uh, that we were able to provide here and uh, as you walk the trail you see some of the uh, waysides and panels because sometimes what happens is once you've done the research of a particular site and then maybe the next step is to create develop interpretation for that site um, and then that site may become a part of another site that's close by but these communities are all around and we're just excited to be here with you all today as we look at this site this place of resistance this place of freedom this place which is an underground railroad site and so I'll be around later on today if you want to ask any particular questions or if you are interested or you know of another site I tell people wherever slavery existed there was places also of resistance and escape and when we look at the Underground Railroad we look at those places of escape and so I just wanted to end by saying that this place this land represents a lot of different things to a lot of people but for those Africans who were enslaved nearby this place represented resistance and the Underground Railroad. It's now my honor to introduce Congressman Clyburn to offer some uh, final remarks with us today. Um, thank you for, for getting it done for South Carolina since 1993. Um, he has held multiple leadership roles um, as things have shifted and evolved in Congress. Um, he's currently the Assistant Democratic Leader in the U.S. House of Representatives. Um, I love that the early part of his career, before he got to play with Congress and all the good and bad of it, um, he was a public school teacher in Charleston. Um, education, interpretation has always been important to him. Um, and he also, this impressive list of things that he has accomplished, um, 38, 36 honorary degrees. Uh, we, are, we are very blessed today to have him join us um, in this commemoration of our Underground Railroad status I guess this designation in this great network of freedom we we're discussing so um, with that I'll pass the baton thank you thank you thank you thank you, thank you very very much I'm going to be very careful getting around here then I'm going to here and make sure there's not a sandbag <laughs> Some of you may let me thank you for having me here trip trip King thank you <laughs> Uh, according to the staff, uh, you did all of the lobbying <laughs> to get me here today, but Tripp and I enjoy your friendship that goes back a long, long time. Brother Reynolds, thank you uh, for reminding me uh, today uh, of our background, uh, you in Alabama and me here in South Carolina. Uh, I, uh, as you just heard, I, my first professional job was here uh, in Charleston <coughs> teaching history in the Charleston County Public Schools. Uh, my late wife uh, come two days on the 19th, today I think it's the 16th. Uh, she will have departed uh, for four years. Uh, Emily was from the little town of Monk's Corner. Uh, or from the suburbs of Monk's <laughs> uh, little area called Whitesville. And so growing up in Sumter, uh, as a real lover of history, as I was, my dad uh, had um, two big rules that we had to follow when I was growing up. The first one was that um, every morning uh, at breakfast, we all had to recite uh, a Bible verse. Uh, we couldn't say the same one twice. And on the day they sat down the rule, they took Jesus' whip off the table. <laughs> <laughs> and um, every evening before retiring to bed, after we did homework, we had to share with him and my mother um, a current event. Uh, we didn't have television, but the newspaper, the Sumter Daily Adam at that time was an afternoon paper that was delivered to our home every day. So 
uh, I started reading the newspaper uh, as a real young child, and I got uh, enamored uh, with uh, with politics uh, and history. Uh, in fact, I told a group uh, last uh, two two months ago in uh, in July that I was celebrating on that day, the 21st, the 62nd anniversary of my 21st birthday. <laughs> So I've been around for 83 years. Uh, and so I was around when uh, Harry Truman was elected president. Uh, and that's what intrigued me. Uh, here's a little guy uh, from Missouri who had failed in business, who had failed in the political world, who uh, had become president, really, by the accident of death. Uh, and um, and who no one gave a chance of getting elected on his own because he had all of these things that were supposedly negatives. Uh, but he he won, mm -hmm. uh, and that to me was I had to figure out uh, how could somebody do that, and that's what got me really involved in this business. But the history of it was always big with me. Uh, and um, so I get elected to Congress uh, after some trials and tribulations. Uh, and um, I um, was approached by various people as to what I should do once I got to Congress. Uh, of course, some people say, you've got to go on the Agriculture Committee because uh, you've got to protect tobacco. Mm -hmm. and cotton. I mean, the big thing, yeah, when I got elected, tobacco was our largest cash crop here in South Carolina. So you got to go in the committee so you can protect tobacco. Then others would come. And was, there was sort of even the divided. No, you got to go in the uh, Armed Services Committee because you got to protect all of these military installations uh, that we have in, in South Carolina. The, 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 at least one person here I know is very familiar with one. Yes, sir. Um, but I had known enough uh, about the trends that were taking place that I knew that that was not going to be South Carolina's future. Uh, yeah, those two big T's, tobacco and textiles, that was it for South Carolina. But I knew the future was going to be transportation and tourism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I went to then Butler Derrick, who was in the uh, Congress at the time from the 3rd District. John Spratt was from the 5th. I said, guys, I got to get on what was then the Public Service Commission. I got to get on that committee. Uh, and of course, um, they got me on. And I devoted uh, as much time as I possibly could to what I knew would be the future of this state. And I knew that tourism was fast becoming our number one industry, which it is today. And I knew that the rural areas like where we are would be left out of that without some special attention. So that's what got me really deeply involved in this, and I and continue to be involved in it. Now, I'm pleased to be here today because I finally learned how to pronounce. <laughs> <laughs> in all of those 83 years, I never called it Bible. Right. I never even heard that until today. <laughs> it was Beedler. Yeah. <laughs> all over South Carolina. Uh, when you married to a Gullah Geechee woman from Monk's Corner, you say what they say. <laughs> <laughs> that's what they call it. So thank you so much uh, for that today. Uh, it may take me some time to get there, uh, but it's going to be badly to me from now on. But I've studied all of this, and I uh, have worked hard to make all of these things a part of our future. Unless, uh, when I got elected, we didn't have a single uh, well, what we would call 
National Forest. We had the Congaree National Monument. Mm -hmm. And um, we wanted to turn the Congaree National Monument into a national park. And of course we did. Mm -hmm. uh, it was my legislation in the House, Fritz Hollins in the Senate, and, and we got it done. But I knew that much more had to be done. And so uh, we worked hard. Uh, we now have uh, the Reconstruction Era National Park. Mm -hmm. I uh, convinced Barack Obama uh, to do an executive order to make it, which he could do. He could not create a national park, but he could create a monument. And he created the monument. And I told him on his way out of office, you do the monument, I'll get the park later. <laughs> and we've got the park. <laughs> and as a part of that legislation, we turned Fort Sumter mm -hmm. and Fort Moultrie into national parks. But we're not, we did not stop there. Uh, those national parks uh, have to be supplemented and we do so with cultural heritage corridors. We now have the South Carolina National Heritage Corridor. We have the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor. We now have the Revolutionary War Sites Heritage Corridor. And we believe very strongly that we have built the network. And if you look at all those legislation, we add the word network to it for a reason. Mm -hmm. So that we can reach out and bring into uh, the entity uh, any site that could can make the case. Mm -hmm. If they come to you and make the case, as you've done with this site, uh, you make the case and you can be a part of this network. Now, Brother Reynolds and I were way back in the days of SNCC. Uh, and we were, years ago, we put away these, uh, these civil rights uh, sites. Um, and we were really confined to just what we designated. We started adding. That's what started us to adding the word network. Because if I'm sitting here in South Carolina doing our thing, they're down in Alabama doing theirs, people in Mississippi doing theirs. We're all uh, part of one network. That's what the Underground Railroad is all about. Mm -hmm. All part of a network. And uh, this particular site is going to send me back uh, to doing some research. Because I'm uh, now, they'll be now announcing next week, I think, Little Brown, uh, the publishing of my third book. My third, first book was about uh, those, I call it Uncommon Courage. It was about the people of Clarendon County who made the decision back in the 1940s uh, that they were going to uh, get rid of segregated schools. And so the very first case, Briggs v. Elliott, started in a little town of Somerton, South Carolina. I knew Reverend J. Eden Lane. My dad was a minister. He and Reverend Delane were good friends. Uh, and uh, he used to pray every morning for Reverend J. Delane and the people of Clarendon County. And so I did a little tabletop book that I called Uncommon Courage. Uh, maybe not the courage it would take to escape from a plantation and take refuge mm -hmm. in a swamp. Mm. I, I don't quite understand that one. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but it did take courage by Levi Pearson first and then uh, Harry and Elijah Briggs uh, later uh, to challenge the system. Uh, and uh, because they're children mm -hmm. walking nine miles to school. Walking nine miles to school. Uh, and they decided to challenge that system and they were successful. So I did my first book about that. My second book I called Blessed Experiences, and I took off on my dad's favorite hymn, uh, Blessed Assurance. Uh, and uh, that is really a memoir. 
But I'm writing my third book. Well, I have written it. Uh, I'm not going through edits. Uh, hope your new neighbor uh, is uh, my copy editor with it. In fact, we spent some time together on the phone yesterday. Um, they're going to announce it next week. This book is called, it's going to be called The First Eight. Now, most people uh, think that I'm the first African American to serve in Congress from South Carolina. Not true. I'm the ninth. There were eight mm. before me. And this book is about those eight people and what this experience did for them. <laughs> and the, the big problem is the 95 years between mm -hmm. number eight mm -hmm. and number nine. Mm -hmm. 95 years. Now, most of you who've studied this history, you know what happened in 1876 mm -hmm. uh, when Wade Hampton uh, was elected governor of South Carolina, when Rutherford B. Hayes was elected president of the United States by one vote. Mm -hmm. Hayes became president of the United States by one vote. That one vote he used to take all of the troops out of the South and left the newly freed, enslaved, left them up to the creative devices that came out of that. One vote is what changed the course of history. And so those eight people that served by 1897 is down to zero. And if you want to know, you don't have to study the history like I do. If you really want to know what was going on in that period, pick up the newspapers every morning. Mm. Mm. Watch the TV every <laughs> evening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And exactly what you're seeing today, exactly what you're hearing today is exactly what took place in 1876. The only difference, the names are different. Mm -hmm. The states are the same. In fact, those three states that sent those duplicate, or I would call them competing electoral votes to Washington, mm -hmm. South Carolina, Florida, Louisiana, mm -hmm same states. And so you're going to send me back to the, uh, to the textbooks and do some research because I'm particularly interested now in this site that I think is one of nine is it, uh, in South Carolina uh, for the Underground Railroad. Um, but I'm particularly interested in Harriet Tubman what she did on the Combahee River, mm -hmm. Beaufort, mm -hmm. and Hampton. Now I know what happened there, but the question is, where is the connection? We gotta find that. <laughs> There's no way in the world for her to have done what she did in Collison County, Hampton County, Beaufort County, along the Combahee River and not in some way right. be connected to what happened here. Finally, I want to thank you. I, I, we also got to do some other rooms. Now, I, I've studied the Maroons. Now, what I'm reading today is a little different from what the Maroon thing that I had in my head from my research. I always took that term from the fact that those enslaved Africans who escaped into these environments uh, hooked up with the Native Americans. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were called Maroons. Now, I've, I, I, I've, I, I've got to find that out because <laughs> the Native American is not wedded to that term the, these days the way it was for me 15, 25 years ago. So I'm going to look at that. 
but I, I want to thank those of you who represent the Native American community here because I am um, also very uh, concerned about that. I, I know about the Trail of Tears, I know about Andrew Jackson, and I know uh, that the Santee uh, Indians, as they were called, were uh, recognized in Oklahoma, but not in South Carolina. Uh, I know all of that. And all of that's a part of what I'm trying to get done uh, before I leave the scene. Uh, and I want to thank you all of what you're doing to uh, uh, not just preserve, but to hopefully uh, help us keep South Carolina uh, in the right frame of mind. Whatever that disease is going on down in Florida, <laughs> I do not wish to see it employed here or any of us catch that in South Carolina. I'm sitting down next week again, as I do very often, with the governor. We don't, the governor and I um, are pretty good buddies. Uh, we don't publicize all of our conversations and all of our meetings, but somebody in this office publicized the fact that we're meeting in Washington next week, so I'll, that's what I'm admitting to it. Today. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things I'm trying to, to make sure is that our history is our history. We cannot change the history. And we should not try to misrepresent that history. It is what it is. <clears throat> and we ought to study it as it is. Mm -hmm. We ought to respect it. I don't think it would do justice to my parents for us to maintain uh, or in any way that their history was not what it was. Mm -hmm. I don't think it would do them justice. And I don't know why I should make anybody uncomfortable Amen. to learn the trials, tribulations, travails of my parents and grandparents. Mm -hmm. Why should that make you uncomfortable? It doesn't make me uncomfortable because since I'm playing around with T's, triumph. Amen. <laughs> triumph is what I rejoice in every day. I know uh, a little bit about my, what my parents uh, endured and I know that there was triumph after the trials, mm -hmm. the tribulations, the travails, and now triumph. So I want to thank you all for what you're doing here to preserve this. But I want to really, if necessary, beg you not to allow anyone uh, to misrepresent this and not to allow our schools to in any way leave this out of our textbooks. It's deserving of everybody's knowledge and hopefully we'll then be able to appreciate what George Santayana was saying to us when he said, if you fail to learn the lessons of history, mm -hmm. you're bound to repeat them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If we learn those lessons, maybe we'll know what not to allow to happen again. There are 95 years between number eight and number nine. Let's make sure it doesn't happen for number 10. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Congressman. Thank you, thank you. Um, thank you to all the speakers. This was really wonderful. Um, I think a good use of mid-Saturday. Yeah. Um, uh, 
Uh, I'm grateful for your leadership, Congressman. I'm grateful for our partners here. You reminded me, Bidler, we actually have members of the Bidler family with us today and the Bidler Family Foundation. So um, thank you so much for everyone that has come from near and far. Again, thank you.